This is State Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Do we have a worldwide, all-encompassing look into the future for Hawaii's energy scene today? My honored guest is Brandon Hayashi, CEO, no, Hawaii Regional Business Development Manager for NG Energy. And I'm going to let Brandon explain the history of it. If you've never heard of NG, it's because it's a, it's a worldwide, but it's just uh, recently come to Hawaii. And fortunately, it's under uh, Brandon's umbrella to this day. So welcome, welcome, Brandon. Thank you. I wish I was the CEO. Mm -hmm. no, there you, you will be. Very good. <laughs> oh, a little, little bit, bit of background for those of you who know what TED Talks are. Uh, I've known Brandon for many, 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 many years. And when he would make presentations, he would make it to myself and uh, my office mate, who's a long, long, long time Toastmaster. And we would just cringe listening to Brandon. We say, Brandon, Brandon, take Toastmasters, no more ahs and ums. And he'd say, yeah, yeah, I just don't have time, just don't have time. And the next thing I knew, somehow I'm Googling Brandon and he's maybe not TED Talk proper, but TEDx, which is the local version of TED Talk. So somewhere along the line, he just leapt into public speaking frame. So again, welcome, Brandon, and let's leap right in. We got a whole lot of material to cover. What is NG and how in the world did it get to Hawaii? Right, so technically NG acquired Optera Energy Services, our mm -hmm. company. And, and let me interrupt, Optera in the energy field, if the Hawaii energy field was a big, big player for, for a long time. Correct, with uh, the, the largest contract we currently have right now is with the Department of Education, the State Department of Education. 265 public schools, that's pretty right. big. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and focused on renewables, efficiency, microgrids, mm -hmm. and importantly, providing all of those return on investment opportunities to deliver societal return on investment via standards aligned curriculum education deliverables. So that's what we had done um, yeah. up to this point, along yeah. with other yeah. projects as well too, some in mm -hmm. the commercial industrial area, not just the public sector. So we're not only going to cool Hawaii schools, but we're going to integrate what you're doing into their curriculum. So the kids, it's a way of educating the kids also. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we were up Terra. Mm -hmm. up until actually just two Mondays ago, January oh, 22nd. Okay, no wonder. Yeah, it's very, very recent change. <laughs> yeah, so we yeah. are technically NG Services US, Hawaii region. Mm -hmm. And what we do is pretty much what we've always done. It's mm -hmm. focused mm -hmm. on the energy conservation, on-site renewable generation, and pulling that all together through as we make technological advancements through energy storage and so forth, mm -hmm. tying that all together with the technology and importantly the financing to make sure projects get off the paper into reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, all of those components are inseparable from one another. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You need them all, right, mm -hmm. to make a project actually become real. So basically what happened, getting to your original question on NG and how did mm -hmm. it get here in Hawaii, so NG, a uh, global corporation, and we'll get into some of the numbers in just a moment, but acquired us back in February of 2016. So it's been mm -hmm. exactly two years. Mm -hmm. We just took on our parent company name, NG, last month, and there's been a lot of back-end support and thought and strategy as how we release it, which is why it didn't mm -hmm. just become NG Services uh, uh, in March 2016. A lot of behind the scenes strategizing. Right? Absolutely, yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm sure you know from your yeah. years of working with the State Energy Office, how mm -hmm. that back end support and planning and strategy is absolutely important absolutely. So when it comes to execution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's as little glitches or hiccups as possible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So NG, and we can get into some of the slides if we will. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Let, let's uh, let's wrap up our, or bring up our first slide. Yeah, there. so Whoa. there we go. So our first slide there basically shows you where we are if you look at the blue. It's a pretty decent chunk of uh, the, the global presence. We're in 70 countries mm -hmm. and uh, this is, data pulled from the 2016 year, so we actually have a little bit more than that number there as far as wow. employees are concerned, or somewhere hovering around just about 155,000 global employees. That encompasses well over 90% of the world's population right there. <laughs> oh, where we are as opposed to the population itself mm -hmm. of employees. Um, yeah, so what I, what I like to share about NG is that 
it's not just about having the physical presence of being in 70 countries and having mm -hmm. so many global employees, but it's the ability, and this is why the back end is so important. We mm -hmm. talked about the rollout, is making sure we can communicate properly. As you would imagine, a global company is gonna choose a language which can communicate the most so that the most of their employees can understand. English is the language that NG chooses. Even though they are a French company based in Paris, our global headquarters is in Paris, English is the main language of which we share via email, calls, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it really allows, fortunately or unfortunately, for monolingualist Americans, yeah. or most Americans, um, the ability to really tap into the global knowledge and resources that NG has. Who can be picking up the phone on a call with Singapore, or Australia, Belgium, obviously France, mm -hmm. in the UK, other parts of the US, Latin America, Africa, and so on and so and you, forth. You've got two tiny little entities, one called China, the other called India, up in there too. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. yeah, just these small little countries, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah and there's, as you would imagine, lots of opportunities, not just in those two um, countries that are really growing in population, and thus to a certain extent, as their middle class grows, there's other mm -hmm. business opportunities. Mm -hmm. But it's really about looking in areas where some don't see normally or typically an opportunity. Isabel Cocher, our um, CEO, our global CEO, head of our NG group, actually just presented two weeks ago at Davos with the World Ooh, yes. Economic Forum. Oh, yes. And oftentimes, not just there, in other places as well too, she talks about access to energy. It's not just the reliability and the security and the resiliency, which are important for no matter where you are from the developing to the developed world mm -hmm, spectrum, mm -hmm. but it's, the, uh, it's about the access, right? And sometimes it's not even just about cost, but also about the ability to just get the technology in hand mm -hmm. in the first place. I'm sure lots of your other guests have been on here talking about the leapfrog effect. We oftentimes talk yeah. about the telecoms community as an example of what's happening in the energy sector. So, so let me guess, as you go into the less developed countries, where in some cases less than half of the population has access to electricity, you're not going to go through the whole, recreate the whole industrial revolution with the belching smokestacks and the Correct. whole business. You're not going to go through any grinding, say, computer technology that was very inefficient 30 years ago. You're going to take the latest and the greatest and boom, get right into those remote villages and so exactly, forth. Exactly, exactly. There's a slide later on that we actually talk about how we look at the needs of mm -hmm. the clients who we're serving and how there is no one size fits all. Yeah. And some of that does take place in rural areas of leapfrogging and not just areas, for example, in Africa, but even in our own backyard in the Pacific as well, too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Because just like Hawaii, a lot of islands don't have interconnected islands. Yes, there is no yes, backup yes. to pull from another island. Yeah, and uh, I've been to some of those islands. The electrical technology is right now quite thoroughly primitive. A chugging old diesel generator right. that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah. Imported liquid fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Again, not unlike what we face yeah. here in the islands. Yeah. Yeah. So should we go to the next slide? Absolutely. Uh, Let's yeah. go ahead. So this is what I wanted to talk about as we, as we look towards the future, because it's important to talk about the present and where directionally we need to go. Mm -hmm. And NG made a dramatic change, a transformation, a revolution almost, if you will, in December of 2015. The company used to be known as GDF Suez, and even that coming together was within the 2000s. So Suez being from the Suez company Suez that built Canal. the Suez Canal, mm -hmm. GDF standing for Gosse de France. So mm -hmm. it's a utility going back to the 19th century in France itself. And the two came together to form the company GDF Suez, which in December 2015, as you may recall, was COP21 held in Paris. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's when NG really unleashed or wow. revealed, if you will, yeah. the NG name. And it's not just about a brand change name, but really about a strategy and how they're attaining these three Ds that you see on the scene. And th these are very intriguing Gs, D or Ds here. Right. And I bet there's a fourth D, but why, why don't we go, uh, sure. go through them here? Yeah. So decarbonization, decentralization, <laughs> and digitization. If you think about it, really, it's a commonsensical approach when we're talking about where energy is going into the future. For a number of years, we've talked about the amalgamation or the coming together of the energy in the IT sector. So digitization, I think, is a very easy thing to understand. We're talking about real-time controls, sensors, monitoring, verifying, and so forth. So you're able to make real changes in real time. And very often with very little energy in right. the communication. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. But those things all make mm -hmm. a big difference when you pull them all together, yeah. right? The amalgamation of them. So, so decarbonization, can you go into that a little bit? Uh, sure. Yeah. Decarbonization, I think, is probably where, you know, for example, with the Maui Energy Conference coming up mm -hmm. in just a little over six or so weeks, 
is focusing on decarbonization as well too, mm -hmm. is really looking at the way in which we decarbonize our current ways in which we live our lives. It's not even just about our transportation or electrification systems, but how we look at our overall footprint, which has to do with the way in which we do many things around the foods we choose, the drinks we drink, Ooh. and the way we do many things. Ooh, so this is a really holistic approach. Then. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, if yeah. you listen to some of what Isabel Cocher talks about, again, our mm -hmm. CEO from our NG group at the global level, it is about encompassing the way in which we live. It isn't just about only traditionally looking at things from an energy perspective. So as an example, one of the initiatives we have both in this country, and I believe it started in the EU, is what's called Cities of Tomorrow. And it's really looking at cities yep. as the focal point of how we make those changes. As yeah. you know, it's moved now past the 50th percentile, going more towards the 75th percentile is the number of total people in our global population of 7 billion plus mm -hmm. who now live in the cities. Yeah. Massive migration from the country to the city. Mm -hmm. And in that, you have challenges, but you have opportunities and obligations. And this Cities of the Tomorrow initiative is really about taking advantage of now where we have our most populous places. Mm -hmm. Again, not unlike the way in which you have your 100 resilient cities that are focused on city solutions. Mm -hmm. Again, in the age of our current administration, where our federal government has not signed on to mm -hmm. the Paris Accord, mm -hmm. our state and our cities are now moving yeah. in that it, direction. Including Hawaii and including Honolulu. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The four mayors have a sign mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that they yeah. will move forward with those obligations. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is it's being put from the federal or national level coming down to the local level. Mm -hmm. and that's where I like, I'm, 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 I like to share and I get very excited about mm -hmm. NG mm -hmm. because what we do here in the islands, I'm still here. I was yeah. born and raised here. Our office hasn't changed. What has changed is the additive factor of mm -hmm. knowledge, experience, access to cheaper capital, mm -hmm. and all those expertise that come to the table yeah. now that we're part of the NG family. Literally worldwide expertise. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. So, so it was decarbonization, and what was the next? Decentralization. Decent yep, yep. yep. So again, from an energy perspective, someone like yourself who's been in the mm -hmm. sector for years, these are non new terms, mm -hmm. but I think when we talk about it from a global perspective, those who aren't in the energy sector, these are things that I think hopefully become more part of the regular lexicon when mm -hmm. people talk about energy, water, and other aspects of our utilities and way of life. Mm -hmm. So you're taking an approach whereby you're completely lowering your carbon footprint, decentralizing or making it more on-site generation, consumption, mindfulness, and so forth, and then using technologies to enable all of this. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the three Ds. But a big part of that, and I kind of mentioned it in the second one there, is what I would, or we're starting to talk about really our fourth D here is decreasing consumption. Mm -hmm. We can generate and control and decarbonize and offset, but what we really need to do is take the first common sense mm -hmm. step in reducing our wastefulness. Wow, that is very exciting. Unfortunately, we need to take a break. Back in a minute with Brendan Hayashi, almost CEO. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Good afternoon again. My honored guest today at Code Green, Brandon Hayashi, almost CEO of NG, a worldwide energy Don't get me in trouble now, Howard. Yes, yes. <laughs> Don't I'm, get me in I'm trouble. just seeing your future here. <laughs> you're so articulate. You're so organized. Got to be CEO one of these days. Thank or, you. Or at thank least you. American CEO. You're generous. You're yeah, generous. Yeah, yeah. So we got so much material. Why don't you jump right in? Well, let's do the, the next uh, slide here. 
Yeah, so the next slide you're going to be looking at is really just a brief on where our heritage comes from. If you're looking on the far right hand side, that light blue is really where we are today as NG Services, US, Hawaii region. But look towards the left of that, and that's really where we came from from the past 40 or so years. We were obviously, most recently, Optera Energy Services, Hawaii, and prior to that, Chevron Energy Solutions. And then really before that, a lot of different companies being brought together to create the solutions that we provide to our customers. Mm -hmm. Throughout that time frame, a lot of the work that we've done has really been focused on three main sectors, and um, mostly in the public sector. That is K-12 education, universities and colleges, mm -hmm. and municipalities. As in the buildings? Correct. Yes, yes. Correct. At the end of the day, the solutions are very similar, but how you arrive at them, whether it be through procurement mm -hmm. or through different strategies, if you will, is where some of the differences are and some of the mm -hmm. needs of the customers. Obviously, K-12 and universities are both educational institutions, but their needs are different for a number of hierarchical reasons. Yeah, just, just one example. Most school buildings tend to be very simple. They don't run all that many hours of the year. Many university buildings can be very complex mm -hmm. and they run many more hours and some go 24-7. Correct. Just, just an example. Absolutely, yeah. and even just yeah. logistics. Right? Mm -hmm. There's 256 schools across six islands mm -hmm. as opposed to 10 campuses on four islands. Mm -hmm. So just mm -hmm. the cost of mobility, as an example. There's just different factors there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's do the, the next slide. Yeah, so what you see here, kind of wanted to, to give you a, a sampling of our thought process here. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk a lot about the need for energy efficiency, and it's imperative that we look at this. Hawaii Energy does a fantastic job, for example, about really getting to the thought process, changing the mindset, and incentivizing financially how to change mm -hmm. and take mm -hmm. energy efficiency steps. We have a lot from the renewable energy community mm -hmm. for years now. I, I mean, it was the fourth leg of our economy mm -hmm. for a moment there. and. Hopefully it comes back to that, but it's not there today. Um, but really it's about going beyond energy. So we use these terms, energy effectiveness or beyond energy. And uh, the thought process here is really about looking at what's needed by the customer mm -hmm. and the human aspect of what's so important. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we absolutely want to talk about sustainability with regards to the overall environment. We are an island. We are witnessing and experiencing climate change in our own backyards, mm -hmm. probably arguably more impactfully than no one else other than perhaps Puerto well, Rico. Like, like the, the North Shore getting all washed out. There's that right next to the highway, there's like a 20 yeah. foot drop mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. because the, the heavy waves. Yep, yeah, yep. You out. know, my mom was a teacher at the DOE for 35 plus years and she would mm -hmm. drive. We, we grew up in Kaneohe and she taught at Haula. Mm -hmm. and she would take that drive mm -hmm. every day for 20 some odd years and then mm -hmm. she later moved to Kailua. But even in that time, you could see huge changes and, mm -hmm. you know, when something happens to Kamehameha Highway, yes, you kind of yes. go all the way around the island. Mm -hmm. These little things are not little things. Mm -hmm. And certainly when you add them up, they are huge things. And so it's really about ensuring that the environmental, ecological impact of the work that we do is conscious and front of mind, mm -hmm. right? When we talk mm -hmm. about climate change mitigation and certainly adaptation, although obviously we need to be pushing harder on the mitigation side because yes. we're going to unfortunately blow through the two degrees centigrade, right, which we're previously okay. aiming for. Um, and really the next level when we talk about uh, the other aspects, you know, it's again to reiterate around the human aspect of things is to remember that we're looking at the environment and we're looking at the costs and then from a dollar perspective and then the cost and the impacts and the benefits from a human mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. Let's we, say, we, we want to improve the quality of life, we want mm -hmm. to improve the quality of indoor air because indoor air can be not so nice sometimes when you live in a central air conditioned environment. Absolutely, and yeah. you know, you and I, when we previously talked, mm -hmm. uh, this was after the TED talk, and it was actually talking about the impact of light on mm -hmm. the brain. Yeah. And so when we talk about air quality, we talk about light, mm -hmm. you know, there are a number of factors in a given space with regards to learning outcomes and even productivity for adults such as you and I, not just our children. So there are a number of things in that area that we want to focus on with regards to human outcomes. There's a whole, it's not so brand new anymore, but the whole medical field of light and health now. Mm -hmm. We With LEDs, we can modulate the light for morning light, noon light, evening light, go into care homes, yep. and people can be indoors, but they're experiencing outdoors through the light. And there's best light to be stimulated by, best light to relax by, all, all of that stuff. Absolutely, and there's different ways in which we can use light, such as UV light, to clean the areas that mm -hmm. we're in, right? Mm -hmm. We know this to be true 
in hospitals where they're doing a lot of testing around where there's bacteria and other viruses in the air and actually ensures that the healthcare workers are operating Absolutely. in a safe manner. Yeah, like uh, Queen's Emergency has concealed UV lights in there because Lord knows what's coming through through mm -hmm. that door mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Especially when you have negative pressure in there, it's keeping it yes, in there, right? Yes, yes, Which is good, it's good. But. A little while ago you were mentioning the, the fact that the energy field as in employment had gone down a bit. It's going back up again now because we have storage. We were able to overcome a, a battery storage issue, mm -hmm. which had to do with permitting. Now, I've talked to all the counties, you can electronically permit. As long as you jump through certain hoops, the first, then you can electronically permit your storage just, just like that. Yes, well, you know, since we're talking about the topic of storage, mm -hmm. I mean, it is really critical as we look at the energy paradigm going yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah. And it is about having that, again, we talk about reliability, but mm -hmm. also the flexibility yes, to, yes, do, yes. to generate it when we have the resource available and mm -hmm. to use it when we actually need it. Yeah, because right now, in the middle of the day, we have so much PV out there that we're, on a sunny day, we're producing too much. Hawaiian Electric can't absorb it. But if we have all this storage, store it all up there during the peak of the day and then use it at night <clears throat> when we have our peak demand. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And NG is involved in a lot of that as we speak I right now. I know that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you know, as, you, as you're aware, there's obviously going to be forthcoming, um, hopefully very soon, the RFP, the finalized RFP for the large-scale utility um, RFP from the from HECO. The mm -hmm. PUC has mm -hmm. to approve the final version of the RFP. And that's something that's going to be utilizing both the PV or other renewables mm -hmm. generation along with the storage intelligently. Yeah. Not unlike yeah. what happened at KAUC with their projects. Yes. And we'd better jump to the next slide. We got so much to talk about <laughs> here. Yeah. Oh, this, this is, is a pretty. yeah. I apologize. It's a little <laughs> bit of a busy diagram or busy uh, slide mm -hmm. there you have in front of you, but important nonetheless. And really, what I hope the takeaway that people can immediately see from this is not just the title itself about energy can power progress, but really showing how at the core of what we do, energy is at that center point, mm -hmm. right? When we talk about efficiency, renewable, storage, and, and so forth, it's really about that that powers our 21st century lives and lifestyles that we have. Now, to be clear, for sure there are changes that we need to make in our lifestyles. We as Americans, I think per capita, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. are certainly the highest uh, number one polluters in the world. Yes, there yes. are changes that need to take place, but there are ways, again, opportunities exist in those challenges. And it says mm -hmm. using the core, right, which would previously one could argue was the problem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, after the Industrial Revolution, we became accustomed to this way where energy provide this convenience across our lives. Mm -hmm. Now it can become a part of the solution. And it ties into all aspects when we talk about how we communicate, how we finance, mm -hmm. how we build, how we engage, how we speak to one another about our lifestyles around energy, water, and then some. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one component there, STEM education. How, mm -hmm. how does STEM, uh, let's see, that's science, technology, engineering, engineering, math. math. Yeah. How, yeah. How, how is that gonna fit into the picture? Yeah. You know, so STEM, some people look at STEM as just those four. Mm -hmm. I would argue really what STEM, or sometimes STEAM, mm -hmm. you have arts inside there after uh, uh, the E, uh, uh, right? Uh, uh. Hmm. Sometimes what um, people would argue is it's just those individual components. I would, and certainly NG takes the perspective that it's more than that. It really is the amalgamation of all that coming together, and it's about challenging and educating children with real-world solutions mm -hmm. and via real-world problems, mm -hmm. right? So using an interdisciplinary approach to come up with a solution. And you, we were talking earlier about you're going into the public schools, so you're not only going to have all these efficiency measures, reflective roofs, LED lights, but PV on the roof, and what's going to be in the classrooms for the right. kids to see? So I know we talked a little bit about this last time, but um, I don't want to bore your, your listeners or mm -hmm. viewers too much. But basically what is gonna happen, and what has happened actually for the past three years, our teachers, we use the train the trainer model. Mm -hmm. So we're training up our teachers mm -hmm. who then obviously educate their students, but we give them tools. We have hands-on learning kits that they can borrow. Mm -hmm. So each school mm -hmm. has a tool library or library kit that they can borrow from that has all types of components that allow them in real terms to be able to engage with physically the components that are being put on their schools. Mm -hmm. So they can go outside. A lot of it is either flipping the script on the classroom where the outdoors becomes the classroom, not mm -hmm. just the four walls that they're mm -hmm. normally within. And so they engage the environment, the educational tools, and they have in our data, and what's been shown to us is real takeaways that last for a yeah. lifetime. Yeah, yeah. 
And of course, that's where our future lies. Absolutely. Our, our, Absolutely. I have kids. two kids in the system myself. I mean, uh, uh, that is where the future yeah. is. And they've got to be a lot more aware than we were when we grew up. Mm -hmm. Because that, that's what got us into these problems. Yeah. So Absolutely. They're, they're, they're going to be the solution. You know, going back to these three plus one or the four Ds, right, mm -hmm. around decarbonization, decentralization, digitization, mm -hmm. and decreased consumption, those are things, you know, I, I drill into my boys, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's what we do through our educational processes, because it's not just a nice to have, it's a must have. Mm -hmm. Because we live on islands, but because of the way our world is going, and going back to climate change, and you know, if we can cap it at only three and a half degrees Celsius, I think mm -hmm. we'll be lucky. You yeah. know, we're way past where we want it to be, mm -hmm. or some of us want it to be anyway. And just to stick with schools for a minute, we there's this talk about cool classrooms. You're not only going to make cool classrooms, you're going to make healthy classrooms, educational classrooms. That is the goal. Shebang. That is the and goal. And the energy use instead of going up with new AC is going to go down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have actually a couple of schools that we've provided to the DOE as models mm -hmm. that can be replicated in numer lo numerous locations that do just that. With the AC, their overall consumption is actually less than when they didn't have the AC. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. We, I think we've got one slide left because we don't have much time left, <laughs> unfortunately. No problem. Yeah. And actually, this yeah. is really appropriate that we end on yeah. this. So what you have here is really NG's thought process on, I wanted to pull an example of a technology because mm -hmm. we were talking a lot about processes, thoughts, policy, and politics, and really bring it down to the practical level. And when we talk about our islands and we talk about our solutions, even for our islands, there is no one size fits all. But certainly when you hear, and microgrid is becoming more and more a buzz term even mm -hmm. outside of the energy sector. Mm -hmm. And there is no one size fits all. And in fact, I think if you were to ask five people, you might get six or seven definitions yeah, of what a microgrid yeah, is. Yeah. Even though our federal government has one definition, people mm -hmm. still interpret. And so this is an example of what we're looking at from our perspective. When we're reaching out and engaging, developing with clients, is really looking at what are their needs? Are they going to be, or do they intend to be grid connected or completely islanded and off grid? Mm -hmm. Are they a mm -hmm. small kind of facility or a larger facility? Or is there somehow an opportunity to bundle them together? For example, the DOE has over 4,000 buildings in their 256 yeah. campuses. Yep. So there's different ways in which we look at that. And thus, because the customer's needs are different, so too obviously are the solutions. And one has to be looking at microgrids and many other solutions and technologies mm -hmm not necessarily always as a completely new case-by-case -case type of approach, because I do believe there are, is room and there should be space for templates, mm -hmm. but there is no one-size-fits-all per yeah, se. Just for instance, there are some really small rural elementary schools, and then there are big, big high schools like Farrington and Campbell and so forth. Very totally good, different very different. good example. Yeah. I, I would argue with our DOE, you're, you're absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Especially the schools that, the elementary schools that were built within a certain time frame mm -hmm. in around the 1960s, you can almost see by looking at it from a drone mm -hmm. snapshot, which schools were built when, because there are mm -hmm. certain models. You have the office here, then you have their spine mm -hmm. going out like this, right? Mm -hmm. First, second, third, fourth, and then fifth, sixth grade would be upstairs. There's all kinds of templates I would argue, especially for the elementary schools would be a perfect example. Mm -hmm. But even when we talk about hotels, resorts, commercial buildings, right? There are obviously differences there, but there's more similarities than there are differences. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways to make sure that anytime you can use a template or uh, learn from past experiences, you're obviously able to cut down on the cost, which just makes it better Absolutely, for the customer. Absolutely, right? yeah. And the lower the cost, the more we're able to roll out because yes. the, the private sector, they've got to make a profit. And you present a good package to them, they'll say, yep, we'll, we'll do it. Yep. And time matters. Time matters because companies want to flip their investments. Time matters because we can't wait because of climate change. And time matters because it en enables more profit. And very timely that you should mention time because time is up. Code Green, Brandon Hashi, thank you so, so much. We're just getting rolling. I mean, we'll... You know, we'll bring you back in about six months, and mm -hmm. you're going to have a whole, whole new ball game to talk about here. Appreciate it, Howard. So, Code Green, Howard Wig, back next time. Thank you very much.